I'm, I'm going to have a hard time concentrating tonight because we have a Chiefs fan right here in front of me. I wasn't happy last year in the Super Bowl. <laughs> you got, we have another Chiefs fan here, too. <laughs> you guys together? Oh, boy, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're all on the same team when it comes to the Lord's work, right? <clears throat> We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Even when you, know, when you walk through the doors of the church, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, black, white, male, female, yellow, purple, purple hair, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. None of that matters when you come into God's church. But if you're a Chiefs fan, that well, I don't know. <laughs> No. All right. Well, um, we like to start on time, and uh, we draw the names because you're on time. But I'm also going to give you another bonus for being here on time. How many of you hate it when you feel a cold coming on and, or a flu, and you say, oh, I wish I could do something to stop it right now? And then you, you know you may be going through days of Ugh. suffering. You can take Theraflu or whatever. I shouldn't name names. You can take some kind of cold medicine, <laughs> flu medicine, but they just treat symptoms, really. They're not working. Would you like to know what my remedy is for colds and flus? I, I, and I'm going to do it tonight if I can, <laughs> if I can borrow your kitchen because I don't have access in the hotel and I don't like to use microwaves, but I bought all this stuff because I, I said I need it, you know, and I haven't had a chance to use it yet. But um, garlic, I don't have grapefruit, but grapefruit, lemon, lime, any citrus, onions, put it, chop, chop it in chunks. Don't peel the fruits, just leave the skin on it. Chop it in chunks, throw it in a pot with some water, boil it. As soon as it boils, turn it off. Let it simmer a little bit. You drink that tea. You can sweeten it with a little honey. I know it doesn't sound very appealing, but it, it's good stuff. Drink that. You can sweeten it with honey if you need to. Drink a hot cup of that tea while you're sitting in a hot bath. Now, I, I won't be able to do that either in the hotel, but you sweat. You just sweat while you're drinking that, sitting in hot. It's so good for you. And then you finish your hot bath with a cold shower. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not telling you what to do. You should Check with a physician if, before you do anything like this if you need to. Okay. But this is what I do. I finish with a cold shower. I used to, I'm a re certified hydrotherapist from Weimar. And, uh, and then I'll usually do three cycles, hot and cold, with that. And I go to bed, drink another cup of that tea, go to bed, wake up in the morning feeling great. I've got something going on in my throat here because... I was trying to be helpful to someone who was doing a bake sale in order to support their Pathfinders, and I bought some cookies at the office this week. And I ate a little more than I should have probably. They were vegan. This lady at the office makes amazing vegan foods. They were vegan cookies, but that doesn't mean they were completely healthful, right? They had a lot of sugar in them. So <clears throat> I was feeling that in my throat. I've been drinking teas and stuff, but I think I'm going to nail it with the ultimate cold and flu remedy. So I encourage you, if you ever need it, try that. It works wonders. All right. So praise God, even though the enemy's trying to make me sick so I couldn't be here with you, God is prevailing. So we're not going to let anything stop us. All right. Let's draw some names, Pastor Michael. Uh, why don't you let the young lady behind you draw the first one? If she draws her own name, we'll know it was really meant to be. This one is Evelyn Kalagos. Where is Evelyn? Okay. Oh, Pastor, we don't even have our things out here. They're in the, the storage there to give you, uh, I think they're still left over here in this room, give you your option of choices here. I don't, oh, I don't know where they put them. We'll remember your names and... 
get the books later if they don't have. He took the card, so we can't draw the next one. All right. Um, that's it. No more. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 All right. We'll see if it happens. Any any questions about this morning's presentation while we're waiting for Pastor? Any questions about the Sabbath? Yes. Oh, my recipe. <laughs> Grapefruit, garlic. I guess I didn't say ginger. Ginger. I don't have ginger. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we don't have the magazines? Oh, yeah, we do. We have one. Okay. So, this is actually for um, later. So, you can choose one of these two. Okay, and then we'll do one more drawing. This is the person with the nicest handwriting, Candace Gaskin. Oh, okay. Is she here? Oh, okay. Well, that's for her. We're going to give it to her. Very nice handwriting. Okay, that's it, two tonight, because that's all we... These, these are for those that attend every night. We'll get an option to um, have the big ones at the end. We're going to give away three of the Revelation and one concordance. All right. Okay, so grapefruit, garlic, ginger, lemon, any kind of, I've, at least those three. And then if you have any other citrus you want to add into it, lemon or lime or something, that's good. You can throw onions in there. And the other thing is, after the tea is after I drink the tea, I eat those. I, I eat the grapefruit. I eat the gar. I eat it all. Um, and um, it makes your breath smell wonderful. You know, your husband or your wife will be happy for you. Yes. Oh, any onions are good. Um, I usually we usually end up with we have red in our house mostly, um, but. I think, is it the yellow that has, yellow or white that has more bite? I think those are the best. But any onion will, will be helpful. And then I, I boil it, add a little honey, drink it in a hot bath. Take a cold shower or contrast showers if you want to do more than one cycle. When you do a contrast shower, three minutes hot, at least 30 seconds cold. I like to go a minute, three, one, three, one, three, one. But make sure you cover your whole body. It's okay to dance in the shower as long as you don't slip and fall. <laughs> the water here is not that cold in Texas. You won't get a great contrast. I was in New England last week, and uh, it's already getting cooler up there. And up in uh, New Hampshire, I, in that hotel, I was getting some really nice, good cold water. Because <laughs> so, I do this every morning. With I just take every shower I finish with cold, just as a preventative. But I do the whole thing I just told you if I feel like I'm getting sick. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So to remove pesticides from the, since we are eating the peels or throwing them in there. Um, so if you're just eating citrus fruit, by the way, eat that white part into the peels. That's really good for you. Same with watermelon. Eat right down to the rind. Um, but you're saying apple cider vinegar and baking soda or hydrogen peroxide. I've also read that um, salt water, just making a mixture of salt water is also useful to remove pesticides from fruits. All right. Well, again, those are freebies. We won't charge extra for that. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that uh, it informs our lives and prepares us for every area of our lives and all the questions that we might have and uh, gives us the knowledge we need to navigate the uncertainties in this world. 
And tonight as we study, we pray that your Holy Spirit, the one who inspired these words, would be right here present among us. Lord, speak to our hearts. Illumine our minds. Let us understand truth. And most of all, let us be obedient to you as we understand truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, you know the story about blueberry pancakes by now. Tonight is another one of those, those topics that is not popularly taught among Christians. A lot of Christians believe a certain thing about death that, as we're going to study the Bible tonight, I believe it's the popular belief about death is not what the Bible really teaches. So if you encounter information tonight that is new to you and different and challenges you, please stick with us. And consider it from the perspective that I'm sharing and see if it's not in harmony with what the Bible says. All right, so the mystery of death. What happens when we die? Is grandma watching from heaven? Can we communicate with the dead? So these are questions we want to answer tonight. And again, we're basing our study on the It Is Written Bible Study Guides. I really want to say thanks to It Is Written and their ministry um, friend of mine, also a fellow Weimar student from the 80s, was uh, uh, recently, he worked in media all his life, and he just now began, uh, within the last month, moved to Tennessee to the Chattanooga area and is working for It Is Written in their media, uh, and I'm really happy for him to be able to use the skills he has for such an excellent ministry as It Is Written. So what warning did God give Adam and Eve about death? In Genesis 2.17, we read, Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He warned them, if they eat, you can have all this fruit, all the, all the food that I've provided for you in the Garden of Eden, except one. And why was that? God, if there's no opportunity for you to disobey, then there's really no freedom, right? If there's no opportunity for you to make a choice outside of God's will, you are not free to demonstrate your faithfulness and loyalty to God. We must have options. And God doesn't bind us into a certain restriction and say, you're, you're programmed like a robot and you can't choose to do anything other than my will. Because free people need freedom of choice. And God never removes that from his beings. He created us as free moral agents, just like the heavenly angels, and we can make choices, good or bad, right or wrong, in harmony with his will or against his will. And so in the Garden of Eden, he gives one tree, which means you now have an option. Show your faithfulness and your loyalty and obedience to me as your creator by not eating from this tree. Okay, so that was their opportunity to be disobedient. And, but he says, I don't want you to do it, in the day you do it, you will surely die. <clears throat> Did they die that day? Sometimes people say, well, see, that wasn't true. They didn't. Well, that day they would have died had there not been a plan of salvation already in place. And they actually began to die natural death, not eternal death, but natural death that day because everything changed when sin entered the world. And, and they and all living things on this planet now experience death because of that choice. All right, so how did Satan encounter what God had told Adam and Eve? The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God has very clear instructions in his word. Satan comes along and says, ah, oh, don't believe that. It's the same today. He still prompts people to say, that Bible stuff is old-fashioned and restrictive. You don't have to believe that. Thank you, Pastor. Just... Do things your way, you know, you're a good person, whatever. And so um, when, when the devil tempted Jesus in the desert, remember what he did? He always tempted him in points, and Jesus answered how on those points. It is written. He always answered with God's word. He said, it is written, and he was faithful to follow the word. We need to do the same. So Adam and Eve had certain instruction about that tree, and the serpent said, no. Now, uh, some of you have heard me tell my story about my favorite pets right now. Uh, you've heard this before, right? You know, some of, 
I have some interesting pets. I, I love snakes. And, um, and I know that Satan used um, snake, the serpent, to deceive Eve. And some people think, oh, that's, that's terrible. You shouldn't have any. You know, I, I grew up being taught any, the only good snake is a dead snake. So we killed them <laughs> until I was about nine years old. And I said, you know what? These are really fascinating creatures. And I started catching them instead of killing them. And um, some people accuse me. Of, they say I'm going to start a snake handling church. I'm not going there. But, but, <laughs> but I, I once had someone write in from another country on a program I was on and, on the Hope Channel. Someone wrote in and said, why is Pastor Nathan talking about pet snakes? Doesn't he know they're evil and they were cursed by God? He shouldn't be having snakes. And so they asked me, do you want to respond to that lady? And I said, no, I'm, I'm probably not going to change her mind. I don't have the time to try to change her mind. But sometimes people ask me that. Don't you know that God cursed the snake? And my answer is, of course I know he cursed the snake. He also cursed the woman. And I love my wife very much. And so I think I can be free to enjoy those snakes too, right? And men, for our sake, he cursed the ground. And I hope all of us, in some point of our lives, have opportunity to work the soil. That's what God created us to do. That's, you know, even if you live in an apartment, you can have plants and care for them because God created us to do that. It's good to be around nature. Um, so the, the curses of God don't mean we can't enjoy his blessings as well. I believe the reason why uh, Satan used the serpent is because it was a fascinating creature. It was a beautiful creature. And when Eve sees this amazing, beautiful creature, and it's speaking to her, and you can imagine the serpent, as Satan's using it, the serpent is, is uh, now speaking, and she's thinking, wow, if that serpent ate the fruit and he's able to speak to me and made him that wise, what will it do for me? Right. So this was all part of... Satan's plan, and it looked like a good idea to have that fruit. Sin always seems like a good idea when you're enticed by it, right? But then the consequences that follow are terrible. And that was the case for Eve. That was Satan's first lie, by the way. And guess what? He's still telling that lie. People still believe, many people believe, that when you die, you don't really die. I see it and read it and hear it all the time. Don't you? Oh, they just crossed over to another life. They just changed form. They're still living in some other world or in some other form. Um, then, so you didn't really die then. Then God is a liar and Satan is right. You will not surely die. That's his first lie and still believed by many. How were Adam and Eve created? The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So God created this perfect human body, but there was no life in it. It was a lifeless being, or it wasn't really a being. It was just a lifeless body. Um, so it was the dust of the ground that he was formed from. Welcome. And then what did God do? You have the dust of the ground, which is the body, and then he adds the breath of life to that dust of the ground, to that body. His spirit, spirit, the word translated spirit means, and we're going to look at it, it's ruach, it's often translated spirit, but can also be translated breath or wind, right? So body plus spirit, and then it says Adam, does it say he received a soul? Sometimes people think your soul is something inside you that, you that lives on. It says it became a living soul. So body plus spirit equals living soul or living being. So a soul is a being that is alive because it has breath in it. That's the equation. Body plus spirit or breath equals soul. That's how God created Adam and then Eve was taken from his side, and she has the same experience. She is a living, breathing body. She is a soul. Uh, in Psalm 146.4, it says his spirit, that's the word ruach, which is breath, same word, when God breathed his breath into Adam, his spirit departs, he returns to his earth, 
In that very day, his thoughts perish. So it's talking about death. He's saying, when, the psalmist is saying, when a person dies, their spirit or their breath, same word in Hebrew, spirit is not a living thing like a ghost, okay? When we talk about spirits as ghosts, that's not what this is talking about. This is saying your breath goes back to God and your body returns to the dust. You cease to exist. In that very day, his thoughts or her thoughts perish because there's no more life and you don't have any opportunity to think, right? So ruach is the Hebrew word there. It's spirit, breath, or wind is the way that it's translated in Scripture. The confusion comes because we use the word spirit like ghost. And people say, oh, they're spirit, they're ghost. Gave up the ghost. You know, you've heard that before. He gave up the ghost. And uh, that is not, and man, now this time of year, what are you seeing all over in every store? (laughs) Ghosts and goblins and Frankensteins and skeletons and werewolves and Dracula. and I hate Halloween. I actually hate it. I'm sorry if I, I, don't, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I hate that holiday. Um, I know some Christians think, oh, it's just a cute little thing. Come on, just dress up and go around. Halloween is the number one celebrated holo, uh, holiday among satanic worshipers. There should be no mixture of light and darkness. They can't dwell together. I believe as Christians we should have nothing to do with Halloween. Except this. It's a great opportunity to evangelize children and their families. (laughs) Right? A friend of mine used to call it National Child Evangelism Night. When the trick-or-treaters come around. (laughs) Because if they're coming to my house, I can give them whatever I want. And I give them little... My wife and I would buy those snack baggies and, and put different candies in it. We, we try to buy the most healthful candies, you know, fruit gummies and whatever, stuff that's not too terribly bad for them. And, you know, when I was a kid, we'd come back with a sack of all kinds of junk and we'd fill up on it. And the next day you wake up and you've got crusty stuff in your eyes and you're congested, and, <laughs> but it was all so good, you know. So, so we try to give them something more healthful and then we always slip a few little tracks in there that are appropriate for children and maybe one for their parents. Why not? They're coming to you. You give them what you want, right? But the holiday itself, Halloween, is horrible. And at this time of year, you're going to see all those things. What I do is I walk around and I put tracks about, what hap- about this very topic, what happens at death. I often put those, uh, or can dead people talk is a good one. I put those right there next to the skeletons and the graveyards and stuff that they have as decorations. All right. Um, If human beings don't have a soul that goes back to God at death, perhaps our spirit returns to God when we die. This is what we're talking about. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit or ruach will return to God who gave it. Yes, but that is breath, not a living spirit. And while my breath is in me and the spirit or ruach of God is in my nostrils, So Job is talking about the same thing. He uses breath and ruach, or spirit, the same way. Two different Hebrew words, but same idea. Are people conscious in death? Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, The living know that they will die. Everybody here, you you know you're going to die someday, right? Unless Jesus comes before you die. Some of us will not taste death. That will be an amazing group of people. Those who are alive when Jesus returns and get transformed in an instant. Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye. Wow. You'll never taste death. Never experience it. But for those who do experience death, um, it's not the end. If you're in Jesus, there's, there's eternal life, right? So we all know that we're going to die, but the dead know nothing. There it is, clear as can be in Scripture. The dead know nothing. And yet there are people who say, oh, no, no, no. We can go meet a medium somewhere, and they can tell us we can go somewhere have a seance, and we can call up the dead and let them speak to us. Not according to the Bible. Oh, I believe that there's somebody speaking to them when they do that, but it's not their loved one that they're trying to contact or whoever it is they're trying to reach out to. Ecclesiastes 9.6 says, All their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. When life, when breath ends for you, life ends. There's nothing. You have no part in anything under the sun, the wise man says in Ecclesiastes. So do dead people praise the Lord immediately after they die? 
Psalm 115, verse 17 says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So the psalmist is saying, I'm going to praise you while I'm alive, because when I die, I can't. If you die and go straight to heaven as a believer, don't you think you would be praising God in heaven? The Bible says the dead go into silence. They don't praise the Lord. They go down into silence. Number seven, how did Jesus describe death? In John 11, his good friend Lazarus had passed, or was ill, and then he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, talking about Lazarus to his disciples. But I go that I may wake him up. And they said, oh, well, that's good if he sleeps. Then he, you know, he'll recover. He needs rest to get well. And he wanted to tell them very plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. He's talking about the sleep of death. Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, speaks of death as a sleep. Why is that? Because sleep isn't permanent. You can wake up from it. And because, did you ever fall into a really deep sleep and then you wake up and you don't, you're like, whoa, what, how much time passed? And where, it happens to me all the time because I'm in hotels so much. Sometimes I wake up and I literally don't remember what city I'm in and why I'm there and what day it is <laughs> and which way is the bathroom and, you know, all that. <laughs> but, you know, when you get into a deep sleep and you wake up and you're like, whoa, you have to... You don't remember what transpired. Where did I go to sleep last night? <laughs> what am... So that's how it will be for people when they wake up from death. Just like they don't remember anything. I want to tell you a story about an old gentleman who um, was a member of my church when I pastored near Washington, D.C. in Maryland. This Danish gentleman had been a conference president in Europe, pastor, conference president, um, missionary in Africa, and now he's a retired pastor. And he would walk every day to church with his cane. Uh, he was 100 years old, almost 101. And he would always, you know, for years, he, I, I watched him through his 90s, and then uh, he would come with his cane, walked very well, he just needed a cane. It wasn't like he was hobbling. He, and he would talk to me, shake my hand after church, and say, hey, you know, we talk about the sermon and then um, I remember one day he was shaking his cane at a young man who was dating the one, one of the, it was a, uh, a non-member who had come, uh, met one of the young ladies in our church that he watched grow up since she was a little girl, and he cared about this girl. So he was shaking his cane at him out in the foyer saying, you better not mistreat her. <laughs> this was a really neat guy. Well, one Sabbath, he came to church, shook his hand afterward, we talked. He went home. He lived in, in uh, a place called Leisure World in Olney, Maryland, and uh, it was like a retirement community. And he was a widower. His wife was no longer living. He had children and grandchildren in the area. And then he prepared his lunch, had his Sabbath lunch, and then he went to take a little nap, his Sabbath afternoon nap, which was his routine, and he never woke up almost 101 years old. And I thought, what a great way to end your life. He didn't die of suffering from some disease or anything. He just wore out. He lived his whole life. He laid down to take a nap on Sabbath afternoon, and that was it. The Lord let him stay in his rest. He never woke up. He's going to wake up from that Sabbath afternoon nap one day when Jesus comes again, and that'll be, he won't remember anything that transpired. That's the teaching of Scripture. It's beautiful. To me, it's much more beautiful than thinking, like in my case, my mother, when I was struggling over my mother's illness, watching her die of cancer for two years while I was in high school, and then, you know, seven years of my life lost to drugs and alcohol, and I think if my mom were in heaven looking down, that's what I thought at the time, she's watching me and I couldn't be good, you know, um, it's much more comforting to me to think, mom's just sleeping in the grave. She didn't know any of that. Her last memory of me was a long-haired drug addict. But guess what? There's going to be a joyful reunion one day, and she's going to see what Jesus did in my life, right? Isn't that much more beautiful than thinking we all go one at a time to heaven, and, you know, we just, and they look down and watch us struggle and suffer? Um, I talked to... A cousin about this and because his mother had died a little before mine of, of cancer my mom's sister 
And he said, no, no, I think it's nice. I like the idea of thinking my mom's up ahead, I mean up above, watching over me. No, I'll take God and the angels to watch over me, but I don't want my dead loved ones to see what I'm doing and what's going on in my life and know the struggles that I might be facing or whatever. So Jesus spoke of death as a sleep, and all through the Bible, Old Testament and New, it's mentioned as a sleep. What did Jesus say to Lazarus after Lazarus had been dead for four days? He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That's important. First of all, it's important that he said Lazarus. He could have woken up anybody in any tomb around there, but he, he's addressing Lazarus, you know, specific. And then he says, come forth, not come down from heaven, not come up from hell, come forth from the grave, because Lazarus was just not existing anymore. If I were to have, uh, um, actually, I don't know, Marvin, do you control the lights where you are? Would you just turn off the lights for me, please? Oh, he he needs to pull his phone out to do it. Marvin's our high-tech wizard, and I really appreciate his ministry. He's helping make everything happen. This is a visual demonstration, so you can... Remember this. Okay, where did the light go? (laughs) Asleep. (laughs) You say, where did the light go? It didn't go anywhere. It just stopped being, right? It doesn't exist right now because it's not turned on. I mean, these certain lights are, are on, but the ones that went off, what happened? They just, you turn off the light, they're gone. There's no more light. It just ceases to exist. Bring them up again for us, please, Marvin. And when you flick the switch on, the light is back. When you sleep in the grave, you cease to exist. And when the Lord speaks you back into existence, like Lazarus come forth, you come back into existence. And God knows who you are. He knows every little detail about your DNA blueprint and the map work that makes you who you are. And he's going to recreate you just the way you are. Except if you're a Chiefs fan, he'll probably fix that. No, no. (laughs) I'm just having fun with you all, okay? He's going to recreate you as you are, minus sinful tendencies. We're going to come up finally glorified in a new body, and we won't be wrestling with the flesh as we are now. But you will be uniquely you. You will be, you know... When we meet in the kingdom, we'll recognize each other. You'll know who you are. They recognized uh, Jesus. Well, not at first. Remember, he kind of veiled himself, but after the resurrection. So you won't lose your identity. You won't become something that you weren't. It's just that you, you can take your character with you to heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Develop your character now with the help of Jesus to be Christ like. And you can take that beautiful character with you to heaven. And you can take friends and family with you to heaven or or do your your best through prayers, right? You want them to come along with you. But the rest, you don't take. So focus on what's important. All right, so Lazarus came forth from the grave. Do saved people go straight to heaven when they die? Acts 2, 29 and 34 says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. So David was a man after God's heart. He made mistakes, a lot, even guilty of murder to cover up his sin of adultery. But in the end, isn't it good to know that no matter who we are or what we've done, God is always willing to forgive us. His grace is sufficient for us. And David rightened his relationship with God. Psalm uh, Psalm 51, if you read it, It's this beautiful psalm that he wrote after his sin, after Nathan the prophet pointed out his sin to him. And he says, renew a right spirit within me, O Lord. It's a prayer to cleanse his heart, make him right with God. So David was right with God upon death. But here it says he's dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. For David did not ascend into the heavens. That was the understanding of the early Christians. They knew 
that death is just asleep and you don't go straight to heaven? Do people possess an immortal soul? Ezekiel 18.4 says, the soul who sins shall die. We don't have an immortality. We are mortal human beings subject to death. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Romans 2.7, Paul's saying we can seek it, we can hope for eternal life and immortality. How? Only as a gift that God imparts to us. We don't have it on our own. Satan tells us you shall not surely die. You are immortal. You're going to live on in some form even after natural death. But God's word says, no, you don't have immortality. It's a gift that God needs to give you, eternal life. All right? In 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16, it says he's the king of kings and lord of lords who alone has immortality. Even the angels, all of his created beings, are mortal unless God gives them life eternal. He is the only one who has immortal life in himself, innately. He is the source of life and the giver of all life. So all his created beings are subject to death if they part from the source of life, if we allow sin to, to separate us. Now, this is a, a probationary trial period, right? We all have a lifetime to determine what our choice is going to be. God gives you a life, and you can choose how you're going to live it. But in the end, there will be a judgment, and you will either have eternal life because you have accepted that gift, or you will not. When do the righteous dead go to heaven? 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, this is a mystery not like you can't understand it. Uh, the Greek idea of mystery is, or the Hebrew thinking and the Greek word, is actually a, like a, um, a special truth that can be understood. It's a mystery to solve. It's something that can be uh, discovered. We shall not all sleep. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Not all of us will experience death but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's when it's going to happen, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. You can jump up and down and shout if you want. <laughs> this is good news, folks. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, incorruptible, no more subjection to sin and death. And we shall be changed. When he says we shall be changed, he's talking about all of us who are alive when this happens. Okay, the dead come up, but those of us who are living will be changed. God will work that miracle while we're alive. And that'll be an interesting thing. I wonder what that's going to be like. Some of us will experience it. When will the, and some of us, uh, in God's mercy, will be laid into the grave before he comes. We don't know which class we'll be in, but we know that that's the, those are our options, right? When will the trumpet sound signaling the resurrection of the saints? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is sometimes called the noisiest verse in all of the Bible. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. I can't wait to hear God shout. I can't wait to hear the shout of Jesus when he comes home to get us, that's going to be amazing. You can, you know, you Chiefs fans were hooping and hollering last year at the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> but imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus comes and shouts, announcing his victory over death. Yeah, I'm, I, I keep coming back to it, Michael. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not a Chiefs fan, are you, Pastor? <laughs> Please tell me you're not a Chiefs fan. No, it's okay. As long as you're not a Cowboys fan, that's good. So. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really making enemies here today. I'm glad you all are Christians and you love me and you'll forgive me. for. So imagine, you know, we get excited when our sports teams win and we're like, ah, this is, we go crazy sometimes, right? Imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back and shouts that victory celebration. When death is finally ultimate, I mean, it really is a done deal since the cross, well, since the resurrection, since Jesus couldn't keep 
uh, since Satan couldn't keep Jesus in the tomb. It's done. It's as if it, it's over already, but it will finally be consummated and realized when Jesus comes back. And that shout, it's going to be something that, it's going to be amazing to hear God shout in triumph, okay? So, he'll return and descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Something I do when I'm home, every day that I'm home, I, I blow a shofar. I have a big, long shofar from Israel, you know, the kind with the... And uh, I blow that thing. My dogs hate it. <laughs> Snakes don't mind because they don't have ears. <laughs> they probably feel the vibrations. But I blow it. I think the neighbors probably... The, the doors are closed. The windows are closed. But it, it's loud, you know. And I, I started out like... <laughs> you know, I couldn't do much. And I kept practicing every day because I want to be able to really blow that thing. And it's so loud. And I, I think the neighbors must all wonder, what is that noise coming from over there? But that's nothing compared to what the trumpet of God is going to be like. It will literally wake the dead. We use that expression. Here it is. There's the origin. In Bible times, did people understand that the dead would sleep until the resurrection? John 11, again, back to the story of Lazarus. Jesus says to um, Martha, your brother will rise again. Okay, so she's upset that Jesus wasn't there. You can, if you read the whole story, you can tell Mary, Martha and then Mary, they both say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my, our brother wouldn't have died. And you can hear the disappointment. They're feeling like, what, where were you when we needed you? We sent word so many days ago, and Jesus did a strange thing. When he heard that Lazarus was dead, he just stayed where he was. People thought he would just rush there to get there before he died so he could heal him. No, he... He literally allowed him to pass. And he made sure he was dead for four days because there was a belief in ancient times that the spirit, your breath, could come back into the body up until three days afterward. That was just the day they settled on. Because, you know, you can imagine someone might have been in a coma or unconscious. They thought they were dead, and then they come back to life. And so they get this idea that, well, you... Hold on to hope for three days, but after three days, yeah, they're really dead and we can bury them. So Jesus waited, of course, until after that time because he didn't want anyone to be able to say Lazarus was not really dead. He waited until everybody agreed, yes, he's really dead, and they buried him. And then when he gets there, the sisters are like, Lord, where were you when we needed you? And Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She was a student of Jesus. Even though Mary was the one sitting at his feet, Martha learned too, right? And uh, she knew the truth about resurrection. Yes, I know in the last day he will rise again. So that's what Christians believed. But uh, of course, Jesus said, well, there's something even better than that coming for you. And he did a special resurrection for Lazarus on the spot. Did Lazarus live forever? He went back to the grave, and he will rise at the last day. Okay, so that was just a resurrection to show that Jesus has authority over the grave. In 1 Kings 2.10, we read, So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The idea that, again, death is a sleep. In the Bible times, did people understand that the dead would sleep until... Oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> then Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. So in the history of the kings, they say, you know, they live their life, they chronicle what they did in their life, and then say, and then they slept with their fathers. Just like the generations before are in the grave, now they're in the grave with them. That's the understanding of death in the Bible. How many resurrections will there be? John 5, 28 and 29 says, the hour is coming in which, this is Jesus speaking, the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, speaking about the Son of Man, talking about himself. And come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. So Jesus spoke about two resurrections. You want to be in the first one. <laughs> we all want to be in the one to the resurrection for those who have done good. So does that mean that we get to be part of that first resurrection because we're good? Is it our doing good that makes us worthy of eternal life? Please understand that's not what Jesus is saying. But those who have a relationship with Jesus, which is our ticket to heaven, right? 
our trust in him for eternal life. If you have that, what kind of life are you going to live? You're going to do good. It's just natural. Make the tree good, Jesus said, and the fruit will be good. And a bad tree bears bad fruit. So if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you're walking with the Lord, then you will bear good fruit. You will naturally do good in your life because God is living in and through you. All right? So he says those who have done good, just in reference to the ones who are going to be coming up in the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, those are the ones who have rejected God in their lives. And evil is the fruit that they bear in their lives. And so they will come to the resurrection of condemnation. We're going to go, uh, in a future lesson, we're going to go more deeply into this. By the way, you may be saying, why are we talking about this in a prophecy seminar? Because this is so key, understanding. This is foundational. You must understand the truth about death in order to understand prophecy about what Satan will try to do in the end times. If you don't understand that grandma is sleeping in the grave, then you could be deceived, and Satan's greatest deception is about to come on this planet. And one of the things he's going to do is he is going to send grandma back to you if you believe she's still in heaven, or she is in heaven, rather, and still able to communicate with you. Grandma could show up and say, hey, I come with a message from God. You need to do this. You need to, and basically he'll deceive so many because they'll be communicating with the dead, and it's not the dead they're communicating with. If the dead know nothing, if they are in the graves, and if they are silent, as all these verses we've read, then who is it that's actually impersonating dead? Evil angels will do that. Satan is as foul and horrible and evil and deceitful more than you can imagine, because he wants most of all to take as many of us down with him as possible. And he will stop at no length, at no effort to do that. He'll go to great lengths. He has already set up his infrastructure, so to speak, through years of deception, through false teachings, even through Christian churches and doctrines in the church, set things up through government structures, through societal changes, the whole world is like the perfect storm is brewing and it's ready at any moment, really. We see ourselves getting closer and closer to the precipice. Things could change so quickly. Did our lives change quickly? And Do you remember in March of 2020, I still remember I was standing in the conference office where I work when I got the news. We're going we're gonna to have a shutdown for 14 days to slow the spread, right? flatten the curve. And our whole lives changed like this, overnight. And everybody was told, be compliant. You must do this. It's for the good of everyone. And many people said, oh yeah, we want to do what's right for everybody. We want to do what's good. And, we, and we, our world's changed like that. We all got on board. Whether you agreed with it or not, that's not the point. It happened quickly, right? The changes all came because there were government authorities telling us this is what you know. Did anybody, did it go, did anybody vote on this? No, there was no time for that. They said, this is critical, we've got to do it. And so they mandated things. Mayors of cities, governors of states, just making mandates, recommendations coming from the, from the president and his counselors. Just boom, everything comes, like, it's necessary, you've got to do this. And everybody did it in panic. And our world changed so quickly. It'll be like that again. It will be even more than that. Crisis after crisis will lead, push us to the point where everybody says, we have to do something. Satan is orchestrating everything. I believe COVID was a, a dry run. You, know? you look at what happened in, in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. This was a civilized country with intelligent people who all started believing nonsense, or, or not? maybe they didn't believe it. Only 10% of the German population was actually registered with the Nazi party. But the other 90% just let it happen. They didn't speak up. They did nothing. I believe that also was a dry run, like a test for Satan to see, how far can I push a society to do the most inhumane, horrible things to others? Mob think 
is going to be a big factor in what happens in the end times. Because who wants to be the unpopular one who says, I'm not, I'm not going along with it. <laughs> not me, count me out. It's hard. You get canceled, you get opposed, you get, you know, you, people think there's something really, you're a bad person. Don't you care about others if you don't do this? Or, you know, this is for the better of society. And that's what they were told in Germany too. We have to do this. So Satan is orchestrating his perfect deception. And um, in the end, he wants to take down as many as possible. So that's why he's got people believing lies, and he'll, he'll do his best to deceive us. Um, can I tell you a quick story, too? I'm, I'm not watching the time. I don't even know. Almost. I have a little time. Okay, so um, there was a Seventh-day Adventist missionary in an African country, I forget which one, his daughter died of malaria or something, little four-year-old girl, and um, he was mourning her death. It was horrible, and they were in a church meeting one night, not long after her death, in a social setting, and his daughter appeared in the midst of the crowd. His little girl came back alive and well and came and jumped up right on his lap, sat on his lap. Do you know how cruel that is? It wasn't a miracle of God. It was a deception of Satan. That Satan would play with a father's emotions like that to bring his little... Of course, well, any father would want to just hug his little girl and love her and say, I, I'm so glad for one more opportunity to hold you. And, but what did he do? He knew his daughter was dead and buried. And he knew there wasn't a resurrection. So he said, this is not my daughter. And in the name of Jesus, he rebuked that spirit and she disappeared. But that's how low Satan will go. And we're going to hear more of those stories. We're going to see more of that kind of stuff in the last days. All right. Did we cover that one? Yeah. What popular deception is countered by the truth of the sleep in death? Job 7, 9, and 10 says, As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. So there's nobody haunting places. I used to run, you know, I had a, I think it was on my 10 or 12 mile loop. I had different courses that I would run when I was living in Pennsylvania. And in one of those country road circuits, I would run past the Maple Grove Inn in, in Pennsylvania. And that inn was famous. I used to drink there before I was a Christian. Um, it was known to be a place that was haunted by an Indian, a Native American, because they say that a Native American was hanged there. Um, I don't remember the full story, but he came back to haunt the place ever since. And so that's popular. I was driving in Maryland one time, coming back from California, and I was just so tired I couldn't make it all the way home. I was in western Maryland. I stopped at a place, and there was, there was no, no place to stop, really, but there was this bar, and I stopped and said, do you have food? They had a veggie burger. I said, okay, I'll take the veggie burger, and I drank a non-alcoholic beer. Forgive me, I love the taste of beer, and I love non-alcoholic beer. It doesn't have any alcohol. You can get it now with no alcohol. And if you think I'm a, a sinful person, just remember, you, some of you eat fake pork, too, you know. And <laughs> if you can have your fake pork and your fake champagne, let me have my fake beer. <laughs> it doesn't have caffeine or sugar. Um, I don't drink soda. But anyway, so I had my veggie burger and my non-alcoholic beer, and I was talking to this lady that worked there. It was just the two of us. She's behind the bar. It was like mid-afternoon. Nobody was there. And, I, and she said, you know, this place is haunted. You, I was asking about the history. She said, this is a, an amazing historic building. She said, yeah, it's haunted. I said, oh, really? She said, oh, yeah, we have, we have a lot of weird stuff going on here. I said, like what? She said, well, at night, sometimes plates actually fly off the shelves. When, and we hear things moving, we've seen things moved around. I've seen it, she said. And I said, wow, you know. I said, have you ever considered having anybody pray to remove the evil spirits from here? And she said, oh, no, no, we wouldn't want to do that because, you know, this, is, that's, this place is known for that. And so they were content with that. I know people personally, close people, who live in old farmhouses in Pennsylvania, and they claim they have friendly ghosts. It's haunted, you know, don't worry, they're friendly. We hear them. 
So this idea that places can be haunted and people can come back, not according to Scripture. You can't have it both ways. If you believe, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you can't believe that. It, the haunted spirits are not departed loved ones. They are evil spirits. Satan's angels. Satan's demons. Fallen angels. Because it says he'll never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. How widespread will the teachings of spiritualism be in earth's final days? Revelation 16, 14 says they are spirits of demons performing signs. In the end days, there's going to be a lot of deception. Um, and then in, we read in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's the great Bible truth that demonstrates um, the sleep of death. Jesus slept in the grave and he came forth. He is the resurrection and the life. So what about the thief on the cross? Let's answer this objection because some people say, wait a minute, you're saying when we die, we go to the grave, we don't go straight to heaven, and yet on the cross, Jesus told that one thief, you'll be with me today in paradise, right? So let's take a look at that. In Luke 23, 42 through 33, then, Jesus, uh, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So in, in the beginning of the crucifixion, in the early hours, both of those thieves that were crucified on either side of him, were mocking Jesus. One of them was soft-hearted enough to notice this is no, I mean, this is an innocent man dying on a cross next to us. This is no ordinary person. He didn't curse at anybody. He, did, he prayed for forgiveness as they're nailing him to the cross. And so he comes to, to actually believe he is the king of the Jews. He is who he said he would be, the Messiah. So then he, and Jesus says to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What do we do with that? How does that work if you're going to the grave and not to heaven? Okay. Um, Lord, so he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Even he didn't expect that the kingdom would be set up right away. He's talking about a future time. The day when you come into your kingdom, remember me. He didn't see Jesus overthrowing the Roman kingdom and when he's hanging on a cross dying. He's thinking of a future time when God's kingdom would be established. So let's look at perspective here. What does that say? Don't, don't call it out. Just in your mind, what are you reading? Is it God is nowhere? Or is it God is now here? You could see it either way, right? Here's the importance of punctuation. I'm so hungry, let's eat grandma. You've got to be pretty hungry to eat grandma. <laughs> Poor grandma. But what if you do this? Let's eat comma grandma. That changes the meaning completely. I'm so hungry, let's eat grandma. That's different from let's eat grandma. The thing is that in ancient writings, punctuation wasn't used. And so you don't have a comma there in the Greek where we read in Luke. What we read before, the way it's punctuated in English Bibles is, assuredly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. But it could very easily be translated this way. Assuredly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, I'm telling you so you can know right now, you can have certainty today. You will be with me in paradise. You can be sure of it right here, right now. I know it doesn't look like it. Here we are both on a cross, but you can have assurance of salvation today that you will one day be with me in paradise. That is so beautiful. Now, I talked to a, um, a theologian once, at a, at a convention, who said he knew somebody who was on the New International Version of the Bible Translation Committee when they were creating the, the, new inter, the NIV. And they literally had a discussion about this. There were some scholars who said, wait a minute, because we know that some, peop some Christians believe in the sleep of death and a resurrection to come in later times, we ought to at least mention, if we don't put the comma after today, we ought to, in the margin, 
have a reference and a mention that it could be after and it could be read this way. And so they debated that back and forth. Ultimately, they decided not to do it. But at least it was discussed, right? It, it tells us theologians understand the importance of a comma. Um, so I, I, I applaud the men and women who were on the NIV study committee who at least were bringing it up and trying to get it on people's minds. All right. So three points to remember as we close. Body plus breath equals a living soul. Body minus breath equals a sleeping soul. The Bible calls death a sleep. And sleeping souls await the resurrection. I like God's plan a whole lot better than the idea that we go one by one, our spirits go to heaven, and we float around in the heavens somewhere without a body in some ethereal existence that's not real and tangible. And then maybe, as some Christians understand it, one day there'll be a resurrection where your body and your spirit are reunited, and then you get to live in a real world, but until then you're floating around like a spirit without a body. Where do we get these ideas? That's from Greek mythology that is not. It's Greek uh, dualism. The idea that body and spirit are different, that anything material is evil and good is spiritual. And so there's a separation of materialism and spiritualism. And so that's where that comes from, that crept into Christianity. And you know who is behind it. The father of lies is behind all of that deception. I like that so much better, this idea that we all go home together in a family reunion type of a setting. Jesus takes us all at the same time. There were a few, though. You know, we can talk about this, I guess. There were some who were specially res resurrected. And we know that Moses, who died, and then it says in Jude that Satan contended for his body, Jude 9. He fought, he wanted to keep the body of Moses in the grave, and, and God said, no, I'm taking him. Moses wasn't allowed to cross over into the promised land, but he crossed over into the ultimate promised land, right? So God took him, and who else is another one that went up to heaven? Elijah. Elisha saw him go in the chariot of fire. Yeah. Often fire is used to represent God's presence or holiness. The angels appear like fiery beings. And so off he goes with this chariot of angels. So Moses represents those who will sleep in the grave and be resurrected and go to heaven. Elijah represents those who will never taste death and will be changed in an instant and go to heaven. And both of them appeared to speak to Jesus where? On the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was transfigured, and Moses and Elijah were there speaking to him. All right. And then Peter had to open his mouth and ruin it all. <laughs> Peter got excited and said, this is great, Lord. Let's build booths, tabernacles, so we can just hang out here forever. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting, though, in that setting, if you read it, in that, in that experience, the voice from the Father says something very crucial. Do you remember what he said? Yeah. This is my son. Hear him. Listen to him. The Father could have said anything to them. He says, just listen to Jesus. What I have to tell you, Jesus is saying it. You just trust the words of Jesus. Okay. So, are you comforted to know that death is asleep and that God has a great family reunion planned on the day when Jesus will return to take us home? I am. I hope you find that comforting too. Uh, the Bible is always death. Um, actually, we're not doing Revelation's thousand years. I, I, I haven't been able to fix these slides. So. But tomorrow night, I hope you'll be here with us and we're studying what? Anybody remember? signs of the times in the second come. We're going to look closely at Matthew 24 and some of the other scriptures which tell us signs of the second coming. Jesus will be returning soon. We're living, uh, when we read the headlines, it's like we're reading prophecy fulfillment, right? Not, we don't try to make headlines fit details of prophecy, but when we see the world, the news of the world, we say, well, this is no surprise. Jesus said it would be like this. The Bible told us these days were ahead. Okay, any questions? Is tonight's presentation clear enough to everybody?
Yes. Praise the Lord. My, my question is, uh, I know at the beginning uh, you said uh, Ruach represents spirit. Now, the word Nefesh, which is the same, uh, can, can we... Uh, Nefesh is soul. Soul, right? Soul and, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And by the way, guys, isn't it amazing that today, um, like I said, it's a good idea to have one of these for when everything goes down, when you flip the switch and the lights won't be coming on, you turn the tap and the water doesn't run, you know, that, that day's coming. And then you can pull this off the shelf and use it. But until then, you can do all this. We talk about nefesh and ruach and these different words. You can do it on your phone with Bible apps. It's amazing. You can tap on a word and it has a number next to it and Strong's Concordance and it'll tell you the word and you can say, show me all occurrences. And right there on your phone, you see every verse in scripture where it's used. You can scroll through it. Read it, understand it. So praise God for technology when it's used for the right reasons, you know? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is this a new idea to anybody here tonight? I don't want to single you out, but was this the first time you've heard this idea of, of death as it is? You know, the, not that you go straight to heaven, but that you actually sleep in the grave. Does it make sense to you? Carlos, right? Praise God. Yes, sir. Yes. I, do we have? After, I don't remember if it's on there or not. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Um, I, I sometimes say hell is my favorite, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I, I, people think I'm a little strange, but the, the learning the truth about hell gave me so much peace because I actually initially came to God through a fire escape religion idea, fire escape, you know, if you ever heard that term. I don't want to, I want to escape the fires of hell, so I better get right with God. And I thought it'd be terrible to live one lifetime of sinful pleasure and then burn for all eternity because of it. And so I thought I better, you know, I came to God out of fear of hell initially. And then there's another motivation that people have. Sometimes it's fear of hell, sometimes it's hope of heaven the hope of the reward to live in the glories of heaven. And people say, well, okay, I don't, it's not so much because I fear hell anymore, it's just I want to get to heaven. But the highest motivation, we're told in this book right here, the highest, book, uh, the highest motivation to serve God is, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's loving Jesus. It's because Jesus died for you, because God gave his son, because God has done everything for your salvation, you say, what other response could I possibly have than to say, Lord, I want to live for you? Even if there was no hell to shun or no heaven to gain, in the words of the author, you would still say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm going to live this life. If there's no heaven or hell, it doesn't matter. This life, I'm going to live for you because you've shown so much love to me and blessed me so much. That's the highest motivation because it's not selfish. It's not saying, ooh, I don't want to burn in hell. I'm thinking about myself. Or, oh, I want to enjoy the glories of heaven. Again, thinking about myself. Those are real motivations. That's why they're mentioned in Scripture. It's, it's okay. They're real. But the highest motivation is when we get to that part in our, or that point in our relationship with God where we say, Lord, I just love you and I want to live for you no matter what comes after this life. So, but yeah, the, the truth of hell, and I, I'm sorry, if it's not one we're covering, I don't remember, Pastor, I don't think it's on there, but it's in the lesson set. There's a specific lesson just on hell, and uh, Pastor Michael is willing to study those with anyone afterward. And to, we're, we're going to do 10 of the 25, so the other 15 you can have access to. And it is a beautiful lesson to understand that God would not do something so horrible as burn, have a special little place in the universe where he tortures all the bad people for all eternity while the rest of us get to enjoy the bliss of heaven. What kind of a God would do that? Not a God of love. And my son, when he was younger, a few years back, we were kind of new in our neighborhood and he came out on the 4th of July and celebrating American independence. He wants to set off his fireworks, and we're setting them off in the street, and neighbors came out, and we all started talking together, and the neighbor's daughter, who now lives in Austin, but she was up visiting her parents that day. I lived just south of Fort Worth, 
and, and she, we got to chatting. And she, you know, of course, she asked who I am and what I do. She's a young adult lady, and I told her I'm an Adventist. At that time, I was pastoring a church. I said, I'm a pastor. And she said, oh, I said, how about you? Are you, know, you a believer? She said, well, I grew up in church. She went to the Baptist church. And she said, I, could, I just couldn't. I couldn't stay anymore. I do yoga and Eastern religions now. I said, oh, yeah, I used to do that too. She said, well, I couldn't ever believe in a God who would torture me for all eternity or torture people for eternity because they didn't love him. And I said, oh, me neither. I would never believe in a God like that. And she looked at me in surprise like, what? I said, well, that's not what the Bible says. And I told her what the Bible really says about hell, that it's quick, it's over. It's for those who refuse to accept God's gift of eternal life, there will be flames of hell, yes. They will burn, but they will burn up, and it's over. Just like that. And when I told her that, she said, you have actually given me a reason to think about coming back to the church. Praise God. See, that's another thing that Satan has done to push people away from God. He has painted this picture of a tyrannical, judgmental God who's just waiting for an opportunity to zap you and send you to hell and torture you for all eternity. And who wants to worship a God like that? He wants God to look as bad as possible. And if God's character can be distorted in such a way that he's not appealing anymore, fewer people will serve him and love him. But... You know the saying, to know him is to love him. If you really see how good God is, he is the, the lily of the valley, right? He's the beauty of perfection. He is just everything, the rose of Sharon, the fairest of 10,000. So, you know, when we read those terms, it's not just referring to the, the lover speaking about his beloved. It's actually an allegory as well, referencing or referring to symbolically how we see Jesus how we see God. And when you see who he really is, you can't resist him. He's so beautiful. His character is so lovely. So, I'm watching the clock, and if you need to leave, I get it, but I'll tell you one quick story as well. I was driving home on a rainy Monday night from a prophecy seminar much like this one in Allentown, Pennsylvania, when I learned the truth about hell. They presented the topic that night. And when I learned that, I was relieved because as I told you, I was kind of coming to God for a fire escape religion. And then when I learned that, it was just, I'm driving home and I'm thinking about it and it's going through my mind. This is just amazing. I felt so free. I said, I, I feel so happy to know this, that the worst thing that could possibly happen to me, I'm a new Christian now, right, at this time. And I'm thinking, even if I don't stay on the course with Jesus, the worst thing that could happen to me is that I will burn up in hell. I should fall from grace, and I will not have to suffer for all eternity. And that was comforting, because remember, I'm living with a fear that I might burn for eternity. I was so comforted by that that I thought, ah, oh, that's wonderful. And, and I just kind of said out loud as I'm driving my little Volkswagen, my 71 VW Beetle, and I said, my light blue, it was the third one I had. I loved those Beetles. Totaled the first two. <laughs> Sold the third one when I went off to college. But I said, this is good news, and people need to know this. And then a voice as clear as day in my head, not audible, but in my head, very clearly somebody said to me, yes, they do. And you would think I would be like, whoa, what was that? But I didn't. I just said, like I engaged in the conversation. I said, but who's going to tell them? And the voice responded, you can tell them. And then I thought, what just happened? <laughs> what was that? But I believe that was God's call for me to enter into pastoral ministry, to share this amazing, beautiful, wonderful news of a Savior who is so good that we can't resist him if we know who he really is. So um, that's why I love the doctrine of hell. <laughs> it set me free, and it was, a, and it was very important uh, in the it was a key thing that played into what I believe was my call to ministry. All right. And God is so good that he even helps a, a sinner like me who loves the Eagles to be tolerant and loving toward Chiefs fans 
who taunt me by sitting right in front of me with their chief shirt on. <laughs> What's your name? Giselle. Thank you, Giselle, for letting me play along with you tonight. Um, all right. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you really want to taunt me, huh? You've been sitting a while. Would you like to stand for prayer? Let's stand. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the beauty of Scripture. Thank you for what you have revealed to us in your word and for how every doctrine of Scripture somehow shows us your goodness, points in a connection to Jesus and your love for us. And so we thank you that tonight we've been able to study this important topic. Thank you for what we know revealed in Scripture so that we're not deceived in the end when Satan will use this misunderstanding about death to deceive millions of people. Lord, we pray that you'll help us to not only stand firm in the truth, but also to be, to be witnesses and to, to bear the word of truth to anyone that you give us opportunity to. Bless us now as we continue to walk with you through the rest of this night and uh, give us restful sleep and bring us all back together again tomorrow evening for another study. We pray it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Good night. Thank you. On your way out, don't forget to pick up the lesson. It's lesson number 10 on death. If you, if you uh, are one that registered, we should have a copy for you. <laughs>